Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us here this morning, Lord. Uh, how good it is to be in the fellowship of, of brethren when we're in the house of the Lord. And Lord, I just want to uh, praise you, worship you this morning. For that which you give to each and every one of us and what you give to me as an uh, individual. Just bless this morning, Lord. Bless the worship. Bless the message. And again, bless that fellowship that we have with one another. In Jesus' name. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew the right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord.
Um, we just talking to Tracy. <laughs> Bible study. We're, we're kind of really big with Bible studies around here, and for good reason. For good reason. Otherwise, you know, if you don't know the truth, you're going to be following <coughs> the science. Yeah. <laughs> you ever notice that they, they dispute all of the sciences, but you never see them dispute earth sciences. Yeah. Sun always comes up. You can figure your tides a thousand years in advance. How can that possibly be? Anyway. Bible study. <clears throat> Pastor Wayne, we're doing uh, Hosea, um, Old Testament, 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Be here or be square. 10:15. Uh, if you haven't looked around, you are in Sunday services here at uh, uh, 8:45. Adult Bible study. Brother Don, we're doing doing Romans very, very slowly, but very complete. We're learning a lot of cool stuff. We actually almost got through one verse today. That's right. <laughs> Mark that on your board. Um, Janice Gould, I'm sure she'll be doing our children's ministry. We're very grateful for that. Uh, 1015 also. Um, second Wednesday, 3 p.m., Board of Directors. This is every month, right? And that's coming up. We already had it. Uh, do what? Said all the meetings are done for this month. Yeah, all the meetings are done. Men's Fellowship, 8 a.m. on the second Saturday of every month. Uh, followed by the third Saturday, which is uh, be Women's Fellowship, 10 a.m. Um, women's Bible Study, uh, Joni is doing that for us. Caro's house still, correct? Okay. There's food at that one, right? <laughs> Maybe I'll cross Jess and come over. <laughs> Every Tuesday, 2 p.m., that'll be Women's Bible Study. You don't have to cross Jess. They have been there. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we're going to host Wayne Haven on January 30th, 10 a.m. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. It's an actual concert. Go. Cool. Anyway, that's it. What I got, Brother Perry. Hey. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody doing? It's a beautiful Sunday worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I have some prayers that I want to put out. I noticed uh, Dean and Carol are still not here. So. We need to pray for them, and also uh, Mary Lee, who just was placed in the hospital. We yeah. need to really pray for her for healing. So let us pray. Lord, please, please protect those, our first responders, our military, as always, because they're on the front lines, and we really need them bad, especially our nurses who are really, really tired and exhausted with all the work that has been going on. And let us pray for Dean and Carol, for them to, to healing power so that they can get better and also pray for our sister, Mary Lee, who is in the hospital recovering. And uh, let's just give overwhelming healing power for her and, and, and shine over them. And let's pray for our community and let's pray for the world. The world really needs our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Beacons, please. As we know the Lord loves the church to give her, but we all know that in, in today's times that you know, we can only give what we can give. But uh, please, Lord, pray for us to have the, the funding that we need to keep this church going and to do the things that we need to do, the ministries that we do. Uh, you know, hey, Brian back. All right, Brian. Let us pray 
sure our little man, Briley, that he gets all the funding that we need. Hey. <laughs> He's our junior deacon. <laughs> and uh, just, just really pray for our community that uh, the money can help the people that need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Worship the Lord. Yeah, 
it's nice if we can get up here and just do everything perfect, but they got these imperfect people. All the children. Oh, children. <laughs> Time to dismiss the children. Is that Bill? Bill, you stay. <laughs> Message is about Bill. You know, I'm just kidding you, Bill. I don't have enough time. Yeah. So we'll go with Warren today. Uh, pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you again for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the souls that are here this morning to hear your word. Now I'm asking, Lord, that personal prayer for me, allow me to rightly divide your word, Lord, as we come before you. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Sometime after the first of the year, in fact, the first service of the first of the year, I took us all to Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and we talked about that word apostasy, remember? So we kind of started a series, uh, and my message at that time was, uh, don't be an apostate. That an apostasy, the falling away from what you believe, is contagious. And we're all to be on guard for that thing that we see happening in our church, in our country, in the world, as people are falling away from church services, church membership. Uh, but the bottom line is falling away from their belief in Christ. Uh, you cannot fall away from something you never believed in. So it's only those people who have believed who said they were at the church and all of a sudden they're not there. Those are what we call the apostates. So that brought us to the next message that I taught was, wow, are you teaching Wayne that a person can in fact lose his or, their, his or her salvation? And of course my answer to that was emphatically no. Uh, and I gave a very dynamic message <laughs> Proving it. Now I know that this is one of those things that people split on. And I don't think that when we do get to heaven, they're going to say, you should have been on Pastor Wayne's side, or Pastor Wayne should have been on your side. But I do try to rightly divide the Word of God, and, and I see that there's, there's arguments for both sides, and we have witnessed in our life those apostate people, those people, pastors, some of them, who have been with God for many, many years, and all of a sudden, they're out there writing books about Christ isn't alive anymore. Uh, uh, so we have to be on our guard. So what is it? So I taught another message on, of course, uh, can you or can you not lose your salvation? And to hit the highlights of that, I, I pointed out that salvation is a free gift from God. It is a calling that God has put on your life. Uh, and the callings and the gifts of God are irrevocable. And I gave you the scripture and verse for all those. They're irrevo irrevocable. The bottom line is you can't lose something that you have. And Jesus said, I have not lost a single one. So either Jesus is wrong, or if you have salvation, you can't lose it. And I, I gave the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, where Jesus started off in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. He had 144,000 members of that group. When, he, when it was done in chapter 13, he still had how many? 144,000. So how do you reconcile these promises of God that I've never lost a single yes. one with the concept of, of you're going to lose your salvation? or the apostate who fell from grace, so to speak, right? Um, enter you and me, us. At some point in this thing called salvation, we have a responsibility. We're not saved by our actions. There's nothing we can do to deserve salvation. Of course not, okay? 
But we are also told, when we're trying to reconcile those two, that we should work through our salvation, not for, but work through our salvation with fear and trembling, with reverence to the, to the Word of God. We are, we are told to make our election sure. Okay? How do we do that? So last week, we went into the mind and said, it's simple, everybody. It is so simple. How do you work through your salvation? Jesus says, I am the true vine. This is last week, so I'm still on review. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Whew. Does that mean to say that everybody in the whole wide world is originally in the branch? But if you don't bear fruit, the vine dresser, that's God the Father, is going to come along and cut you out of it. I don't think it goes to the whole wide world. I think it's to the people who have heard that gospel, have responded to that gospel, and are those people that are read about in the book of Hebrews, where it says, you have tasted of the Spirit, you have partaken yes. of the Holy Spirit, you have tasted of the fruits of God, but you bear no fruit. And it says there, for those people uh, who have walked away from God, it is impossible to renew them unto repentance. That's Hebrews chapter 6. A lot of people say, see, see, you can lose your salvation. I say, no, that goes back to the vine. They were in the vine. They were cut out of the vine because they had no fruit. You're not part of the, you're not part of the tree. I look at my trees at home. You guys do this? You look at your trees at home? <coughs> Write down those uh, things that grow from the bottom. I'm not a poor yeah. yeah, those saplings, you know, they grow all around the trunk of trees. Yeah. You, you gotta suckers. Go, sucker, sucker, sucker. That's the word I'm <laughs> you gotta go cut them off. You know, then the tree grows nice and big and develops fruit. But if you let the suckers dominate the tree, right. well, you got a big bush, right? And suckers got to come out. But they were in the vine. They were in the original tree, and you cut them out. See, you're the vine dresser. The God, the vine dresser, there's these people, they're in there, and these are the apostates. And we talked briefly about Something else about the sower who went out to sow. And just so Richard gets this straight this time. Some fell by the wayside. Nothing there. Some fell on rocky soil, but there was no, uh, nothing much on rocky soil. They sprang up really fast, but because there wasn't anything there in the soil but a bunch of rocks, they died out quickly. Again pruning the branches. They were, in, they were originally bearing fruit. It was the Word of God. They responded to the Word of God because Christ said, when in explanation, He said, of that parable, the sower, the, the seed that the sower is sowing is the Word of God. So people respond to the Word of God. They sprang up quick. Hey, I went forward. But they never developed anything in their life. And what I said last week was a lot of people I believe we're in that third category, which is they fell into good soil, but the soil had a bunch of weeds in it. And I believe that's where most of us Christians live, is in a world full of weeds trying to choke us out. And that's why the, I say to you, be careful because becoming an apostate is contagious. You're around an entire world that wants to choke you out. And we have to be careful. We have to be really careful. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer because the vine dresser, the father, is there pulling out the weeds. But we've got to kind of help him. Maybe, hey, Heavenly Father, I don't want that weed in my life. I don't need that weed in my life. So give him a hand. Let him know what weeds you want and what weeds you don't want. I make a suggestion. Get rid of all the weeds. If you know there's something out there that's not pointing you toward Jesus Christ, ask God to get it out of there. He's the vine dresser. It's not what I'm talking about today. <laughs> when I returned from Vietnam, I was pretty messed up. A lot of you guys identified with that. 
We saw things, did things that were horrific over there. I personally was a, a ground machine gun. When I got back to my first duty station back in the States, I knew I was messed up. I didn't tell anybody. And you, you try to come off like you're normal, but you're not. And so I wanted to go to college. I, I was still in the service, but I still qualified for this thing called the GI Bill. And uh, even while I was in. So I started taking uh, night classes down in uh, San Diego. And I, I decided I would take psychology classes because I didn't want to tell anybody how messed up I was. Only my family really knew. Um, but I figured I could figure this stuff out for myself. So I started taking a bunch of psychology classes. I learned that there's three types of psychology. You do. There's the Freudian psychology. We're all kind of familiar with what Freud had to say. You know, he talked about that id. He talked about the ultra ego. Uh, yeah. The Oedipus complex. Everybody knows about the Oedipus complex. But I didn't have a trouble with loving my mother or hating my father. I, I, that was pretty normal. So that didn't speak to me. Then there was the humanist, humanistic psychology. The, the humanists, they're kind of aware of all the flowers gone kind of people, you know. Uh, and that wasn't really helping me out a lot either. Um, you know, let's, let's, set, let's just talk this thing through, you know. That wasn't helping me. So I... I stumbled upon this thing at the University of Oregon when I finally got deeper into psychology called uh, behavior modification. Behavior modification, B.F. Skinner came out with it in the 20th century, uh, 1900s. Uh, and behavior modification seemed to fit what I wanted to do with myself. I wanted to modify my behavior. And according to B.F. Skinner, how to change your thoughts and emotions by modifying your behavior was possible. So, and it, it still didn't totally work. Let me move on. No, this isn't true confession. The concept, said B.F. Skinner, of free will is an illusion. Of course, we as Christians, we know we talk about God gave us free will. But B.F. Skinner said it's an illusion. All human action is a result of conditioning. Of course, we know about Pavlovian psychology, too, where yeah. the dog salivates, you know, the bell rings, the dog right. salivates, that's what we've all been familiar with. So conditioning has been around for quite some time, but this was speaking about something changing your emotions and your thought patterns by conditioning your behavior, you know? And in the Korean War, by the way, the first, first people to really grab on to B.F. Skinner's uh, psychology were the Chinese. Yeah. They're still doing that. Stuff it too. worked. And it worked. And we, we came across this uh, new term back then. It was called brainwashing. Remember when every, yeah. how, how do you wash your brain? No, that was B.F. Skinner, Skinnerian psychology, behavior modification techniques that worked. And what they were finding out in the Korean War was that prisoners of war were, that were being taken captive were uh, writing horrible letters home to the government claiming that the government was really bad, they should never be in in Korea, they should be fighting this war. They were imperialists, blah, blah, blah. So how do you get a Marine or anybody else that's been captured to start writing these letters? Well, here's how they did it. They had total and complete control of this person, the prisoners of war, 24-7. And B.F. Skinner said, the more control you have over the organism, the, the better this plan works, okay, the better 
Skinnerian psychology, behavior modification works. They had total and complete control over the prisoners. They fed them, they told them when to sleep, they told them when to work, they told them what to do, and, and they found out that, hey, come here, private. How would you like a candy bar? No, sir! That's what you're supposed to say, but you're hungry. You haven't had a candy bar in a long time. And you're supposed to say no. You know, name, rank, serial number, right? Then we're supposed to say, that's it. You're not getting anything out of me except name, rank, service number. Period. But you know, that candy bar looks good. So I'm going to sit there and listen to this guy rattle on about the imperialistic America, American states and all this for a few minutes while I digest this candy bar. Well, that's step one. Yeah. I wanted the candy bar. Step two is just sitting there listening to the guy and maybe so do you kind of agree with what I'm saying? Ah, give me a candy bar. <clears throat> By the end of a couple years of captivity these people, some of them, were writing letters home denouncing the United States of America and when they were finally came home they were brought up on charges of treason. And out came the term brainwashing. Yes. It really works. Our brains can be conditioned. We can become so involved in things that if we're living, no offense to people left from Oregon, but if you're living in that kind of a place where two plus two equals five, pretty soon, give me the candy bar, it's five. And the Chinese were the first to do it. Well, they've gone way past that now. Yeah. B.F. Skinner simply stumbled upon something that is true to you and me and all of the entire human race. I'm a pastor. I'm I've got a degree in psychology. Actually, I tell everybody it's in neurophysiology because I, after I got through a certain part, I, I said, I don't want to study any more of this stupid psychology. And I got out into the biopsychology, which is neurophysiology, and then the studying the function of how, how the brain works. So I've got my actual degree in that, but I, I don't even do that anymore. I'm a pastor. Then I went out and built houses. So I never used that. But now, like a psychologist, I'm dealing with a lot of human behavior. Jason, in starting this church, I'd be chasing people out one door and chasing people out that door. And I'd say, come on back, we've got to sit down and talk this through. Well, you were guys in the early church, you remember that. Yeah. I just wanted to condition your behavior. <laughs> it worked. It's been said that you're not who you think you are. Okay? You're not what you think other people think you are. You are what you think other people think you are. That's called the Maslow's self, Maslow's looking glass theory. Okay? So there's a lot of good things in psychology that do apply to us because they're studying the human being. And behavior modification works, and God made us that way. And we are what we condition ourselves to be. And yeah, we can condition ourselves. And God wants us to condition ourselves. Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of people in this world who are being conditioned by others. And they don't even know how stupid they really are. I'm serious. It's easy to pe pick on those people on the other side. Let's just put it that way. Okay? And just say, wow, how stupid can you be? And we've all seen it. We've all, all watched the news. How can they believe in this? But they do. And some of them are very, very uh, emphatic about the way they believe. 
Some of them want to put most of you in, in jail or kick you out of the United States, lock you up because you don't have a face mask on. Yes. They're already throwing pastors in, in prison and jail up there where you guys come from, Canada. Yeah. It's now illegal for you to deny your son or daughter the right to pick what gender they want to be. And you can go to jail up there, so we're hearing anyway, for trying to be a good parent. How did they get there? Through conditioning. Now, we have certain ways that we believe. Why do we believe the way that we believe? Well, at some point, you heard the Word of God. At some point, you heard the Word of God. And let me tell you this, by the way. You started out with 0, 0.0 faith. You had no faith. God gave you a jump start. It's kind of like a car. Battery's dead. Okay? You were dead in your sins and transgressions. Battery's dead. You heard the Word of God. And all of a sudden, you, something happened inside of you and said, I want that. I want that for my life. And you made a decision. You might have said a prayer. Hopefully that happened in somebody's life here in this room. I know it happened with me. And a person wants to believe that from the moment you heard that word, that seed, God's word, landed in the good soil and you're going to grow up and produce nothing but fruits. Right? Unfortunately, some fell by the wayside. Some fell, most of it fell amongst the good soil where all the weeds wanted to go, right? Those weeds are growing in, in blue states as well as red states. Or should I say, in red states as well as blue states. Yeah. So it's not a political thing I'm talking about here today. No. I'm talking about the, the weeds that are growing around your salvation. How did we get this way, by the way? How did we get to where we can be conditioned? We didn't. God made us that way. God made us to be conditioned. I said, wait a minute. Why would he do that? Because we call it something else. We call it free will. Everybody that thinks 2 plus 2 is 5, they have the free will to believe that. But that's not the truth, is it? But if you're conditioned into believing the lie, and by the way, that's next week's message, is the lie. If you're conditioned to believing the lie, you'll believe that 2 plus 2 is 5 eventually. In the last days, the Bible says that they will, everybody will believe the lie with the implication that they even know that it's a lie, but they're still going to believe it. You say, how could we ever go there? Turn on the TV. Mm -hmm. I, I, pastors usually don't say that to people, but you can see it on the news. It's where the world is going. You can say, well, I control my own destiny. I don't think and act what other people tell me. No, you don't. Why is it? Because you condition yourself. And it's basic to all people. It's part of our creation. Let's now look at today's scripture. What, what picture do we have up here? Oh yeah, that's right. I remember it now. Philippians 4.4 4. And it says, what? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So, the Apostle Paul is making a point here. He's repeating something two times. Actually, it's throughout the Bible. I've got a couple other scriptures. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. And, and God throughout scripture is encouraging people 
from start to finish, Old Testament and New Testament, to rejoice, to praise the Lord. We've had whole messages on the values of praising the Lord. Here it's called rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. Why is God saying rejoice in the Lord? Does he need help up there? Running his, the kingdom of the universe or whatever? No. This is for our benefit. God wants to condition us to rejoice in the Lord. A lot of people say, Wayne, you don't do enough Pentecostal things in, in church, you know, to get the spirit going. And they're probably right. You know, you, you, sometimes it's good to go off to one of these Pentecostal churches and just watch these people get their emotion because they get they get worked up. And you say, yeah, but is it just a momentary thing? I don't know. But the Bible says to rejoice in the Lord. And if you rejoice in the Lord, and it doesn't say just to rejoice in the Lord, when you're down at church. Let me read that. <coughs> rejoice in the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. Always. Amen. Always. Amen. That's a little harder to obey. Rejoicing in the Lord. Always. Wait a minute. But my life is full of a bunch of tears and this and that. How do I rejoice in the Lord always? Say, Lord, Lord. Sure glad you showed me that weed next to me. <laughs> How do I rejoice when things are falling apart? And then the Bible's telling me to be anxious for nothing, but in all things, all things, through prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. Then the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's the candy bar. There we go. We'll guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, I, 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 and the peace of God. I'm sorry. The peace of God. There's the candy bar. What surpasses all understanding. Give me a private. Let me give you a candy bar. God is conditioning us. He's telling us what to do. And if we do it, we will condition ourselves. These are just good exercises that a Christian should be doing. And there's benefits to doing it. Let's read on. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true. He's going to tell us now what to think about. Whatever things are noble. Whatever things are just. Whatever things are pure. And we know what these things are, don't we? You know if something's rotten, good for nothing, should be... Uh, thinking about this. Yeah. Get it out of your head. Maybe you're thinking bad thoughts about somebody. Stop it. Hmm. Bob Newhart. <coughs> I just had a thought. I've said it. I saw, I saw a thing with episode. it was an episode with Bob Newhart and What's that female that... No, it wasn't Stan oh, The comedian. Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett, there it is. Okay. Oh, I can explain the thing. So, <laughs> Bob Newhart is a psychologist. He's sitting at his desk. In comes Carol Burnett. I've got a problem, says Carol Burnett. You do? Says Bob Newhart. Yes, uh, I've got a problem. Can you fix me? He says, well, I don't know. I've got two options. I've got the $500 option, or I've got the $5 option. Carol Burnett says, what? You've got a $5 option instead of a $500 option? He said, yeah, the result's the same. Well, so what do you want, says Bob Newhart. Well, I want the five dollar one if it's the results are the same okay give me the five dollars exchange the money bob newhart made his desk all up and looks down says i'm going to give you the five dollar version stop it all we really need is the five dollar version and God says that in his word 
need to stop it. And you know when you're doing right. You know when you're having bad thoughts. So the Bible tells us right here. Hey, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there's virtue, and if there is any virtue, and if and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is God doing here? He's conditioning us. He's, he's saying, hey, here's what you need to what? Big word, big word. Do. <laughs> if we only did the things that God told us to do in his word, we would become really neat conditioned people. We call them Christians. As we work through our salvation with fear and trembling, try something. Try doing what God said to do. Amen. It's a novel thought, huh? Just stop it. All the other stuff, just stop it. It has no place in your Christian life, in your Christian walk. Now, as for me, I've already arrived. I don't have any problems. <laughs> do you want something? Oh, you got something? <laughs> no, I'm the pastor. We're talking to Sandy. Oh, you are? Oh, I'm going to go straight to the source, huh? Yeah. And have a talk with Sandy about that. No, we all got them. But we are responsible for conditioning ourselves in accordance with what the Word of God says. Why? Because it works. It's been scientifically proven that it works. You want a good brainwashing? Try this on. Try this on. Say, well, I don't believe in that. Reading through the story of, of the of this guy that got eaten by a big fish. Wow. I remember as a baby Christian, that's, I'm going to find the explanation for that. God parting the, the Red Sea. I've got to find an explanation for that. And I always get off on these, these documentaries that try to explain how God did it. The truth of the matter is, after you've been through this about a billion times, you just go, God did it. You don't have to figure out the scientific way he did it. He just did it. What he wants you to do is know that he did it. He wants you to take his word in as truth. I can say next week we're talking about the lie. This week I want you to know that God's word is true. Okay? It wasn't true what the Chinese were doing to the Americans that the Americans are, are deplorable. deplorable international uh, bad people. <laughs> so they, they were using the same techniques though. Because God made us that way. And B.F. Skinner stumbled upon it. Pablo stumbled, stumbled upon it. Yeah. Hmm. God doesn't want to brain wash us. He wants to soul wash us. He wants our very being to be committed to him. Why? Because he wants us to make it through to the end. For those he, for, he called, he also, for those he predestined, he also called. For those he called, he justified. For those he justified, these he glorified. He just want to be one of those people that stays in the divine until the very end. Oh, we've got some dead wood. That's what we're talking about. We're in the vine, but there's dead wood every so often comes up upon our branch, right? I was just joking about being perfect. That was a joke. Oh. They think I'm serious, Mom. <laughs> Time for you to take over. No, there's none of us. We all got dead wood. And God prunes away the dead wood so we can bear more fruit. Good God. Good word. Work through your salvation with fear and trembling. Allow yourself to be conditioned by the truth, which is the word of God. We hold this up and say, this is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the very Word of God. It is God. Let it condition you. Because that's the way you were created. That's the way you were programmed. Hmm. 
And, again, if you think of things that are true, things that are noble, if you think all these things and you're meditating on those things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, this was the Apostle Paul speaking, these do. That's the hard part. These do. One of the biggest words in the Bible. Hardest one to understand. These do. But here's the candy bar. And the God of peace will be with you. Never thought of using that psychology stuff. But it is true. These social science people at best have just stumbled on something that God put in there in the beginning. And they're looking at the human being, us, trying to figure out what makes us go this way or that way. In the world today, they're trying to make us go the other way and believe that it's truth. Yeah. And it's not. It's a lie. The things in the Word of God are true, and we know it. So you have that little jump start of faith, right? That little jump start of faith. You went forward, you said a prayer. And last week I said, and I want you to re I want to repeat that this week. Say that prayer every day. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. Today. Every day. Say, what do you mean? Rededicate? Yeah, rededicate your life to Christ Jesus daily, moment by moment. However often it, you have to do it to convince yourself that you're His. How do you become His? You can become His by saying you're His. And you won't be one of those people that will never be lost. Because you keep saying, I'm yours. And guess what you're developing? is a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to worry about Matthew chapter 7. Depart from me for I never knew you. Because you're talking to Him every day. You're having a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to defend yourself. Hey, come on in, Wayne. I know you. So don't worry about it. Just do it. We spend too much time worrying about if I'm one of the ones that's called or not one of the ones that's called. Just do it. Be a, be a Bob... Newhart. 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 <laughs> Be a Bob Newhart. Just do it. Stop it. Do it. I ended last week when we talked about John 15.5. It's kind of a sad ending. We're talking about the vine and it says in there for without me you can do nothing. That doesn't really cheer me on that much. Okay? It's a truth. It's a truth. But I like the flip side of that better. In Philippians 4.13, the Apostle Paul puts it in the positive. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I wrote a song about that. I'll need your help. We didn't practice this one too much either. That's what you practiced in. This, this is what I thought of that song. Was. But I got to tell where the song came from. I was locked up in prison. You know, I wasn't listening to the Lord. At some point, all that Vietnam stuff got to me, and I was. I wound up taking four hostages and, and armed robbery. Anyway, they, they put me in prison. That's why I lose all the new people. Sorry, Alan. <laughs> but I had nobody to write to in there. You know? So, I mean, I wrote to my sisters and, and my mother and stuff like that. But my wife dumped me uh, when I was married to at the time. And she had a right to. But, uh, called my aunt, and I said, Doris, I said, is there anybody you know that could send me a letter, you know? 
maybe put some perfume on it or something. And... <laughs> she says she didn't put perfume on it. So I get this letter, and it's just a postcard. And it's a picture of an itty bitty mouse. And he's bench pressing an elephant. And the caption on when you open up, when you open it up, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I, I looked at that, I got a big smile on it. It did, it had perfume on it, Sandy. <laughs> I mean, I could smell it. <laughs> Good <day. laughs> So I was inside of a prison dorm, and I had this postcard in my hand, and people probably thought I was nuts. That's where they throw most of the nut people. And I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things because I know He cares. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things because I know He's there. I could move mountains or calm the sea. I can do all the things just like the man from Galilee and even greater miracles and greater deeds because Jesus said we could do great things if we believe I can do all things through Christ strengthens me I can do all things because I know He cares. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. I can do all things because I know He's there. I've got the power to stand and fight. God with your request and salvation, then he'll give you the candy bar, which is peace. Isn't that what we really want? Is peace. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word, which is capable of changing our very existence. Our word, your word, Lord, that will condition us into the, and mold us and shape us <laughs> into a little miniature image of you, Lord. 
Let it do its work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.